publisher of the North Bay Business Journal. It is my pleasure to welcome to you today to part two of our wine conference. This is our first, our first virtual event for 2021. As your new publisher, I look forward to working with you as the NBBJ continues to be your number one resource for information and data on trends and initiatives that promotes the business in the North Bay. As a longtime resident and media executive in the North Bay area, I know the importance of the wine industry in each of our markets. And I don't have to tell you, last year was enormously challenging. Today, we'll hear from two experts in the wine industry. They will walk us through the trials and tribulations of 2021. Even more importantly, they'll share their insights of where the wine industry economy is taking us in 2021 and into the short-term future. But first, let us thank our underwriter sponsors for this event. Perella Bross and Martel, LLP, Moss Adams, Wells Fargo's Bank, Zaponi and Company. Thank you for all your support and underwriting sponsorships. Before introducing our first speaker, I'd like to remind you all to use the Q&A prompt on the bottom right side of the screen. After each speaker, I will present the question, allowing them the opportunity to answer the question during the event. Our first speaker today is Sarah House. Sarah is the economist for Wells Fargo Bank. As a former research associate for the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, Sarah looks at national economic trends, including how the pandemic and post-pandemic will affect and change consumer buying habits. We're honored to welcome Sarah here today with us. Welcome, Sarah. All right, well, thanks. Thank you, Norma, and thanks everyone for joining, joining today. I'm excited to be here with you and share where we at Wells Fargo see the economy heading in 2021. Now, I think uh, 2020 reminded us that there's, you know, a, a good dose of, of humility needed when involved with forecasting. And as we look ahead to this year, um, there's still so much uncertainty that um, that comes with the outlook. And it's, it's pretty unique this year, too, in that in many ways, so much of the uncertainty lies up front. So ultimately, this is a public health care crisis. And so the virus is, is in control of the economy. But as we look out further into the year and under the assumption that we do get a, a better hold on, on the virus, um, when we look at the monetary and fiscal policy response today, it's, it's been pretty extraordinary. And I think it actually presents um, a pretty, pretty strong picture for, for the second half of, of the year, or at least stronger than I think a lot of folks had heading into this crisis. So as we talk about the, the outlook for this year, it's really going to be a, a story of two halves. So we are starting the year on a very tenuous footing. So we have um, virus cases near record highs. We've seen hospitalization capacity constrained. Deaths are continuing to hit um, record highs at over 3,000 per day, nationally speaking. And we've seen response from both uh, local governments as well as uh, individuals uh, change their behavior in, in trying to combat this virus. And so you can see with some of the real-time activity indicators. So households are spending more time at home. So you see this nationally, um, but even uh, to a stronger degree in, in California, just given what's happened with, with cases there and, and the government response. And with that, we're seeing a lot less discretionary spending, or at least a, a pullback in, in terms of that discretionary spending. So um, we use the open table dinner reservations as, as a good proxy for that. And you can see what the restrictions have done there to, to California dining. Um, but really, we've seen a, a pairing back in activity over, over the past month and a half or so, more generally a, across the United States. And we're seeing this slowdown in the broader data, too. So in November, we saw a decline in personal income. We've seen retail sales decline two months in a row. And in December, we actually saw employment contract for, for the first time since April. So we are seeing momentum slow as, as we start, the, as we start the, the year. Now, as we look ahead, though, 
so the first quarter we know is going to be pretty weak. It's almost a coin flip in terms of whether you get a, a negative number uh, or, or we continue to, to eke out growth. But come spring, we do think that we are going to see activity thaw alongside the weather. So um, we are getting vaccines rolled out. So yes, it's taking longer than what I think um, was initially envisioned or, or hoped for, but it is gaining momentum more, more recently. And also in addition to, to the vaccine situation, so we the relationship between the virus and, and the economy has changed. So yes, we've seen a pullback in activity more, more recently, but even with these, these record case and, and strains on, on, on hospital capacity, you are seeing business businesses and consumers adapt where they can still engage in, in some activity. And so with a better control of the virus and particularly the help of the spring weather, which will allow for some activities like outdoor dining to, to be done safely, we see activity um, really picking up over the course of, of this year. So con consumer fatigue over mitigation efforts will, will be a part of, of that as well. And so we're looking for growth to probably average around 7% annualized in, in the second half of the year after we're, we're more or less flirting with with the economy contracting uh, at the very start. So again, it's it's a, a there's a large juxtaposition between the, the rough couple months we have ahead and what's likely to be um, a pretty strong second half of, of the year. Now you can see that play out in terms of the level here where you see the, the level of GDP almost stall here near term and then take off again over the second half of the year. Um, we anticipate GDP will recover its, its pre-COVID peak um, that was set in the fourth quarter of 2019, probably um, sometime around the third quarter, maybe the fourth quarter. Um, although it's important to remember that the economy will still be smaller than, than it would have otherwise. There's still some, uh, some productive capacity that, that we're not using to, um, to think about it in kind of um, broader macro terms. Now, a big reason though that um, even as we're, we're still not, even as the economy is still not as big as it otherwise would have been, um, it's still overall pretty fast recovery, especially when we compare it to, to the Great Recession. And a big part of that is that the fiscal response has been forceful this time around. So we saw in the two months uh, between February and April where you saw 22 million job losses in the economy, you actually had personal income jump about 10%. And so that reflected what we saw in terms of the direct checks um, to households, as well as what were very generous unemployment insurance benefits. Now, that stimulus that was brought about by the CARES Act back in March has faded over this past year. And but you can see that personal income, um, once you factor in those payments and, and what we were seeing in terms of employment compensation, it's still above what it was back when, when the recession, uh, back when the recession hit. And of course, we have a, a new fiscal package that was signed at the end of December. So it's about half the size of, of the CARES Act in March, but it does bring additional money to, to households in terms of another round of, of direct checks. Um, it also extends the extra unemployment insurance through, through March. And so those folks un, uh, out of work will, will be getting higher payments uh, in the order of about $300 extra a week. And it does another round of uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, which should also help employment and, and therefore for household income. And so when we look at that, we're, we're actually in a pretty strong, uh, the household sector is actually in a pretty strong fi financial shape. So I think you know one issue, though, um, particularly when we think of things like the the direct check, is, is especially for households who haven't lost their jobs, is is how do they spend that? So we've seen that uh, you know between the 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 amount of fiscal aid that we've gotten, as well as the fact that households can't go out and spend the same way that they could prior to the pandemic, we have seen the savings rate jump. So back in November, um, it hit about 13%. So that's about twice as high as it was coming into, coming into to this pandemic. So when you factor in that households have been saving at a much higher rate over the past year, by our calculations, they have probably somewhere in the order of one point five trillion dollars in excess savings sitting in their bank accounts or, or ready to be spent. There's a lot of firepower in terms of consumer spending once we get a, a better handle on the virus and once it's it's safe for, for households and consumers to go out and, and engage and, and spend again.
Now, we know that all households don't save equally, so savings is skewed towards, towards your upper income households. But even when we look across the, the income and wealth spectrum, we see a pretty different picture in terms of, of household financial health than we did uh, when you compare it to, to 2008 or, or even coming out of the, the 2000s recession. So you can see back in, in two, coming out of the, the Great Recession, so it was your upper income households that, that recovered most quickly, even though there it, it took a number of years. Your, your lower income households, and uh, unfortunately I don't have more, more detail in um, than the bottom 50% to, to get sort of a, a kind of a real-time basis here, um, that took years to come out where, where your lower, lower wealth households didn't recover until about 2017 in terms of their wealth. But here we are um, just a quarter after the, the crisis hit and you actually have across the, the, wealth, the wealth spectrum, households have, have recovered um, their, their net worth. And so the, the balance sheet picture is, is much stronger across the board, um, reflecting that, that that higher savings picture is, um, is, is pretty broad. So of course you do have um, households who have lost their jobs, not, not in that picture, but by and large, you've seen a much quicker recovery, thanks in part too, to the fact that you've had a really strong housing market over this cycle. So that was a big source of the, the loss in wealth, um, particularly for your, your bottom 50%, but that's been, uh, that, but that's a sector that's actually done very well as folks have put a premium on, on space in, during this cycle. Now, in terms of, of how that spending is, is playing out, so it's not that households haven't been, been spending at all. In fact, we've seen that, that overall spending is, is only about 2% shy of, of its pre-recession peak, but the composition has shifted quite dramatically. So you can see that non-durable goods, so this includes things like your, your grocery, um, games, and, and hobby goods. So that's of 5% from where it was back in, in February. Durable goods, so that tends to be your, your autos, um, furniture, that's actually recovered um, by the most. And this is an area where we actually tend to see a, a pretty substantial lag coming out of a recession where, where folks are pretty cautious. Um, they don't wanna make those, those big ticket items. But here we are with people stuck at home. And so they are looking to upgrade their, their home furnishings. Um, they're okay with maybe purchasing that new car because they wanna avoid public transport or they don't wanna fly, fly long distances, but they will maybe purchase that R RV. And so we've seen tremendous spending on durable goods. Now, as we look ahead to 2021 and it gets safer for people to go, go out and about and do um, engage in some of those high contact services, which have been hit so so poorly and you so badly, and you can see here um, declining seven percent since since February. We're going to see a shift in in the composition of spending. So durable goods, by definition, are designed to last multiple years, and so we think a lot of that demand got pulled forward. But as we look over out into this year, people are are eager to get out. They're tired of of staying at home, and so that's going to support a lot of those those in person services. So some of those might be uh, less discretionary things like medical care and, and medical appointments that have been put off. But a lot of that is going to be discretionary, just given that, that high level of savings and the fact that consumers, they have the means and are eager to spend. So that's going to be things like travel and, and restaurants, we think, have, have a tremendous bit of upside in, in, 21, in 2021. Now, if we look at the job losses from this cycle, so you've seen um, so you've seen services like, uh, as it has in, been in spending, services, jobs in the service sector have been much harder, but even then it hasn't been even. So services um, like finance or professional services or information, things that can easily be, be done from home. So we haven't seen as stark job losses there. Those also tend to be some of the higher paying, higher paying jobs. And so when you look across the income spectrum, it's been very uneven in terms of who has been hit by, by this pandemic. So those that were already in the best financial position heading into this with the highest paying jobs, we've seen only modest job losses there. Whereas if you go down to this lowest paying quintile, so this is where a lot of your restaurant workers show up, a lot of your hotel workers, um, good number of retail 
uh, retail sub industries, you see that um, the job losses have been steepest and they're actually turning down again. So when we talk about jobs uh, declined in December, really this was a story of the leisure and hospitality sector. So we saw job losses there of, of almost half a million, um, even though on net total job losses in the economy only declined by, by about 140,000. So the, the disproportionate hits to the service sector and particularly those, low, uh, those lower paid service workers continues. And this is where this talk of, of a K-shaped recovery um, comes from, where, where your upper income households and, and those who are already in better shape um, continue to see a recovery, but you get weakness coming out of, of those that were already the, the most financially vulnerable. If there is a silver lining to this, it is that when you look at the aggregate spending picture, so you tend to see, not surprisingly, um, more spending done by households who have higher incomes. So in fact, if uh, the top 10% uh, of, of households in terms of earnings account for about half of all consumer spending. And so the fact that um, job losses have been skewed towards the lower end uh, means that you, you don't have quite as big a hit to aggregate income as you would if those job losses were, were evenly distributed. And we're not seeing those, those lower end job losses spill over in, into high end um, uh, at, at this point, and we don't think we we will just given that ultimately, again, this is a healthcare crisis. This is um, so much of the, the pain is caused by the need to social distance, which impacts those, those high contact services. And so what this means is that the aggregate spending picture remains um, fair, the, the fundamentals there remain fairly, fairly strong as we get come out come out of this, and that should help boost hiring um, in many of those high contact services, which have had the need for to, to social distance, again, given that the firepower in, in terms of spending is there. And so when we look at the jobs picture, so, um, you know, I'd say I'd, I'm, I'm more constructive on this than I think I was the, the last time um, spoke to you, given that we haven't seen those spillovers into, into some of those higher income um, jobs, which have a, a more damaging impact on, on aggregate spending, which filters down to, to, those, service, to those service jobs that, that have been hit so badly. When we look at job losses, you tend to see a large share of them um, remain temporary job losses. And so um, these are workers that expect to get recalled back in, in roughly six months. Now, we are 10 months into this pandemic, and you have seen the number of permanent job losers rise. But it remains notably smaller than, than what we saw coming out of the, the last crisis. And overall, you still have a, a relatively high share of folks on, on temporary layoffs. So this means that they're still connected to their employers and it should make it easier for, for them to become rehired. There's, there's less chance of them getting sidelined and, and creating more structural barriers to, um, to employment re returning both on an individual basis as, as well as in aggregate for the economy. Another interesting thing about this about this period has been the fact that while you've seen uh, unemployment spike, just given the a lot of business closures, um, whether they were temporary or or long term, you've seen um, a lot of people drop out of the labor force. But it hasn't just been the fact that we've seen uh, that we've seen a, a dearth of jobs available. So um, this is again where, where the health aspect of this crisis comes in, into play, where you've seen a sharp drop in labor force participation as people have been um, staying at home or, or leaving the jobs market either because of health concerns. So this is particularly true for, for older workers who had been um, one of the fastest growing components of, of the labor force over the, over the past decade. And and who were, who were uh, one of the few groups to actually see participation rise coming out of, of the Great Recession. Um, but you also have you know, parents who can't uh, easily juggle work and remote learning or, or having to cut back on, on hours. And so, uh, and so there's, it's, it's not just about labor demand this weekend, but it's also been the supply. And so when you look at the demand for, for labor via hiring plans or, or job opening rates, yes, it's, it's weakened since the onset of the pandemic. But when you compare it to, to prior downturns, whether the 2001 or the 2008, um, we actually have a somewhat, somewhat tighter labor market than you might expect just by looking at the fact that we're, we're still 10 million jobs shy of, of where we were back in, in February of 2020. So a lot of businesses are having 
having issues um, with staffing. So whether that's finding people to come in um, to, to hire in the first place or just issues with absenteeism as um, parents are juggling school closures or you have people out sick or, or you know, possibly exposed to the virus. And so in many ways, you actually have a tighter labor market um, and, um, and, and there is still that demand for, for a lot of hiring, which could pull us out of this faster than I think a lot of people expected. So adding to that story of the fact that I think once we get a better handle on the virus, you are actually, uh, the economy is pretty well positioned to, to rebound pretty quickly, is the fact that credit conditions remain fairly accommodative. So this is a, a credit conditions index. The higher this line is, it means um, the more available credit is and the cheaper that, that cost of credit is. And you can see back in March, we saw tremendous tightening, um, the tightest credit conditions we had since the financial crisis. But the Fed stepped up to the plate and they stepped up to the plate in, in a big and quick way. So we saw the Fed funds rate cut back to zero um, in less than a month. We saw asset purchases resume. We saw emergency lending facilities launched. And so that helped restore Credit, so that helped restore liquidity in, in the markets and has kept credit flowing. And this marks a, a really important distinction between that last crisis. So the last crisis was a, a financial crisis. It was a balance sheet recession where there were major imbalances in, in, in the financial sector and in the household sector that needed to be corrected. Whereas this time around, you actually have households in, in their balance sheets in stronger shape. Um, they don't need to reduce spending over, over the coming years to, to right size their financial position. And so this also bodes well for, um, for the overall recovery. Now, you have seen credit for things like bank loans tightened to, to some extent, even though we, we haven't seen a, a broad credit crunch. Um, but ultimately, when we look at what's, what's holding back businesses, credit isn't, isn't the issue. So if you look at this, this blue line here, so this is the, the share of small businesses reporting that their number one problem is either uh, financing availability or the cost via interest rates. And you can see how that remains you know, almost as low as it can go, just 1% of, of responses, um, notably lower than what we saw, again, coming out of the, the last crisis, but also really over the, the 1990s as well. Instead, you see the, the strains on small businesses right now just coming from the fact that with this uh, this coronavirus recession we've had demand sap particularly if you are in those high contact service industries as well as for a lot of folks um, who maybe aren't directly impacted by by having to social distance um, by by labor constraints um, so this is things like in construction and manufacturing where they're having trouble either getting people to to fill positions or um, again, issues over, over absenteeism as they're trying to juggle um, either potential exposure or child care, um, any, number of, any number of things. And when we look out ahead, I think there's, there's reasons to be optimistic about, uh, about growth um, as well, coming from the fact that um, through this pandemic, it, it seems to have lit a spark in under entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship was something that the U.S. had been struggling with um, really over the, the past decade or, or two, number of um, causes of, of this, or at least theses uh, around it. Um, but we've seen um, through the, the coming out of, of lockdowns, we actually saw um, business applications soar and not just among your sole proprietorships, um, what are officially termed non-high propensity, meaning not likely to, to hire people, um, but also your high propensity businesses. So those are, are businesses and industries that are likely to actually hire additional workers. So in some ways, you know, necessity is the mother of invention where you had people stuck at home and you know, had some extra time on their hands and were maybe pushed to, to maybe start an idea that they had been thinking about. Um, but this also brings back the, the importance of, of the stronger balance sheets this time. So the fact that um, in the spring you had households getting uh, additional, um, additional funds via stimulus checks, even if they were still employed, or what were very generous unemployment uh, benefits really allowed that financial cushion, I think, for some folks to, to start. Now, not all of these new businesses will, will stick, but um, the fact that you are seeing um, some start, I think, bodes well for um, the potential for, for business creation to, to rebound and, and offset some of the losses in, in businesses that, that we certainly have seen. Now, how long might the Fed stay easy and kind of keep this, this um, favorable credit environment? Uh, well, the short answer is probably a long time. 
And that's because the Fed has taken a more dovish stance on inflation. So after the past decade where core inflation, this brown line here, um, undershot the Fed's 2% target for pretty much the entire decade. Um, the Fed has said that it wants to see inflation actually rise above 2% for some time um, so that we see inflation expectations come up a little bit. And basically you're, you're not as close to uh, the, the risk of a deflationary cycle. Um, and they also have the availability to, to stimulate the economy more by, by cutting real interest rates um, if inflation is, is a little bit higher. And it's likely that you'll see inflation jump here in, in the spring when you're looking at it on, on a year over year basis. So we saw a lot of prices for things like um, travel, you know, airfares, hotels, apparel um, collapse last spring. And so it's going to make it look like inflation is, is pretty high here in the second quarter. Um, but in terms of whether that translates into to ongoing stronger price increases, I think remains to be seen. Um, I think there's a good chance that you get slightly higher inflation as you do have so much demand coming out of these lockdowns and in some ways restrain capacity. Um, but you also still have fairly low inflation expectations. So it remains to be seen. Of, of whether the psychology of, of inflation has been broken, but there's certainly the potential for, for inflation to, to strengthen. I just don't think it's going to be to the extent where, where the Fed feels like they have to actually start putting the brakes on, on the overall recovery. So that should keep interest rates very low as we head um, over 2021. So we do expect interest rates to drift up from what were extraordinarily low levels in, in 2020, but they're still going to be they're still going to be rather low. In fact, below what we saw um, before the pandemic in in 2019. Now, what I'm showing you here is is benchmark Treasury rates, um, and but why that's important is because this is what uh, what businesses and household loans are are based off of. So the fact that that your overall Treasury rates um, will remain fairly low um, means that that your your interest rates for for business loans and consumer loans should remain um, pretty low as well. Now, you'll notice they're still higher, though, than, than 2020. What's driving that? Well, one is that we are expecting slightly higher inflation in environment. So there is that inflation component of, of that increase in interest rates. Um, but a big part is the fact that um, we have seen this, this tremendous fiscal response. Well, that's come at a cost. And so you've seen the deficit increase um, roughly about 15% of, of GDP. And so with that comes a lot more treasury issuance. So you have a lot more supply of, of, those, of those treasuries out there. So that's going to push, um, push up the, the yields on those. So investors are demanding a, a little bit more. Now, at what point, though, is that deficit a, a problem? Well, it's hard to say. So I think given that this is um, this is an important aspect of limiting the scarring and making sure that we don't see a, really a permanent reduction in, in how much the U.S. economy can produce, um, it, it is important to, to spend at this point, particularly given that interest rates are so low. So I think what's been an interesting aspect of, of this downturn is despite the unprecedented amount of, of fiscal stimulus that we've seen, the cost of, of that debt is actually expected to decline over the next 10 years relative to, to what it was likely to be before the pandemic, um, just because interest rates have been cut um, cut so low because of this this period. And so, um, you know, if you think of, of household debt, or sorry, if you think of, of government debt, it's not like a household. Um, they can roll this over for quite some time. So it's really more of, of the interest cost of that debt that is, is the major, major constraint over the long run in, in terms of that debt. And so from that perspective, um, things still seem, seem to be in check. But the question is, what happens when those interest rates eventually do begin to rise, when the Fed does does normalize. Um, I think you will be having to, to talk about this debt rather rather differently. Um, but I think that in many ways, that's a conversation for, for a later date and just the immediate focus um, of, of policymakers is just to get out of, of this crisis with, with the least damage possible. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there and see if Norma has um, any questions for me. Thank you, Sarah, for your knowledgeable intel in this industry. Let's hope for a better and stronger economy in the future. Now, I do have a couple of questions that came by from the audience. Question number one, what role will or should the federal government play in supporting the recovery? Will the shift in political power help or hinder the assistance? 
So I think um, that's really been one of the distinct um, features of, of this crisis and, and the response. So you had monetary policy makers, the, the position of monetary policy in terms of where interest rates were and, and where the Fed balance sheet was it, was, it was much more constrained than what we saw coming out of, of the financial crisis. So, you know, the Fed's done all it can. It's, you know, it's, there's maybe more tweaks it, it could do. Um, but ultimately, this this does come down, I think, to, to the fiscal response, given those constraints on, on monetary on monetary policy. And again, this isn't a, a matter of credit. So that's what, what monetary policymakers can address. This is really a matter of, of demand and really tiding over a lot of households and businesses that weren't unviable um, heading into this, but um, but really just got blindsided by this, you know, what was considered a, a major tail risk. And I think when you look at, again, where interest rates are, it's, you know, it's relatively feasible for that fiscal support to, to come. I think you can argue about what it should look like, um, you know, whether you should be giving checks to, to all households, regardless of their job situation, or how much extra unemployment insurance you want to pay and, and how much of an offset does that create in terms of the incentive to, to return to, to some of these jobs? Um, but I think by and large, just given the, the cost of, of that fiscal stimulus, and again, trying to reduce the long-term scarring, I, I think there's, there's a big role for, for fiscal policy to play. Um, whether we will get more fiscal relief, I think is, is, a question, is an open question. You'd think with Democrats controlling both houses of Congress and the White House, um, it would be a slam dunk. But the, but the Democrats have the, the most razor thin margin they could in the Senate. And if you're going to get over the, the filibuster with this, you still have to get 60 people on board to, to increase spending, which means you're gonna have to get um, a good amount of moderates. You can, you, you can do it with a simple majority through the reconciliation process, but even then you, you'd still need moderates. So um, it remains to be seen if we get more stimulus, but I think if you see, um, you know, slower rollouts of vaccine and still um, heavy burdens on businesses and households um, come springtime, especially when those unemployment uh, insurance expires in March. I think that's when you you might get some some movement. But again, it's it's not a slam dunk. Okay. Second question. Do you have time for a second question? You're, it's it's right. your show. Well, we've got a few minutes, so let's go ahead and go for it. If rising consumer spending is one of the things we hope to emerge when the, pan when the economic effects of the pandemic recede, what are one or even two categories of spending we can expect to take the lead in the recovery and why? So I think um, broadly speaking, it, it'll be services, but I think even if you drill down to that, it's it's those services that uh, households and consumers have had to um, shy away from, from the most. And so I, I really think probably the most upside lies in things like um, travel and, and tourism. So maybe not so much business travels. I think businesses have, have learned to adjust to doing more conferences like, like these, or at least maybe some, some smaller meetings that you previously would fly across the country only to meet with, with a couple folks. Um, but I think people are, are eager to go on vacation again, um, to go out and eat at a, at a restaurant. And again, they have the means to do this just given um, the amount of fiscal support we've seen, where the saving rate is, and so I think that's really where you'll see the, the most upside next year, this year. Okay. <laughs> Thanks again, Cher, for sharing your insight into the national economic picture. We appreciate you being here. And speaking of a search for a light of hope in 2021, last year, the wine industry not only had to face challenging times during the pandemic, but they also had to manage wildfires. Those fires became, became a reality during harvest season, make it even more devastating for the wine industry. Here today to offer his expertise on the impact Mother Nature and the pandemic had on the wine industry is a real expert, is a real expert in North, Northern California in the Bay Area, John Moramarco. John is the managing partner of BW166 LLC. In addition to his role as managing partner, he's also editor and partner of Goomberg and Fredrickson. John's perspective is drawn from decades in the wine business. As a team working in the vineyards, he eventually earned his way leading teams for large companies 
such as Constellation Brands. His leadership has expanded to guiding key players in the wine business with insightful analytics. Welcome, John, and thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Norma. And let me get my screen shared here for everybody. And uh, good morning, or possibly for a few of you, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you may be in listening to this. The topics I want to discuss are shown here, and I want to go through you know, what 2020 looks like and then future expectations. But I want to mention that uh, you know, I'm kind of looking at the industry and going back through my history of uh, being involved with Hiram Walker Alley Demec in 1989 when we bought Cote de Bois in Sonoma County, when actually the wine industry was in a slight decline on a volume basis. I'm drawing on um, time spent with Constellation running Canandaigua Wine Company their largest volume uh, producer in, uh, during 9-11 and just kind of the impacts of a uh, difficult time for the country. I'm looking back at uh, the Great Recession when I ran uh, the international business for Constellation and just kind of the impacts of the recession on wine overall, which was actually much greater internationally than it was domestically. And then uh, more recently, when I was running Winebow, a uh, distributor and importer based in New York, New Jersey, when we had Hurricane Sandy and just kind of a different type of impact more related to the wildfires. But to be honest with you, looking at uh, the pandemic, um, it's probably going to have longer term repercussions on the industry than any of those topics that I mentioned. And I'll get into that now. Just looking at long term trends, Wine volumes, as most of you know, have been growing fairly constantly since 1993 at a 3.2% CAGR, and this is volumetrically speaking. Although the last couple of years, we've seen growth slow to about 1%. Uh, the oddity this year, and I'll get into the details behind it, volumes uh, look like they're going to be up 6.6% in terms of wine entering the U.S. market. Uh, but believe it or not, one of the biggest drivers of that is flavored beverage wines from Mexico which I'll touch on. But looking at this time from 1993, I mentioned that we bought uh, Clos de Bois in 1989 when the industry was fairly flat and worked out to be a very good acquisition. But in 1993, the average boomer was 37 years old and they really started driving the wine business by moving into wines. But we have to remember when they started driving that business, we had the wine coolers in the 80s, and then we went to fighting varietals and premium varietals and more premium priced wines. And it's been a progression that uh, the industry and the boomers have lived through together. And it's been very uh, promising both for, I think, the enjoyment of the boomers, but also the industry. Another interesting thing about the wine business, and this is looking at consumer spending back to 1960, even though we had some bumps in the uh, volume, Consumer spending on wine has actually been growing fairly consistently through uh, recessions, difficult economic times, 9-11, et cetera. However, I have to say that consumer spending on wine this year appears to have declined 9.6%, obviously driven by on-premise, and um, the impact on producers hasn't been near as great as it is on total consumer spending, and this change has actually been part of the savings that Sarah's talked about. Um, boomers have driven this growth in value over time, but I mentioned a, a moment ago that boomers, when the growth trend in wine started in 1993, their average age was 37. Millennials, are going to, their average age will be 37 in 2023, two years from now. And so we hear a lot about millennials and they're not doing their fair share yet, but I actually think we've been expecting too much of them and there's a great opportunity there, but we have to figure out how to take advantage of it or actually not take advantage, but build their interest in wine so it actually continues to make their life better and make the industry better. Getting into 2020, and these this is all wines entering the U.S. market. And when I look at wines entering the U.S. market, these are tax paid shipments into the market, not necessarily consumer consumption, but the two have historically tracked fairly closely. Everybody knows it's been a challenging year. As I said, growth overall is going to be up about 6.6%. But when you really look at the categories of wine, traditional still wines, which, you know, look at the North Bay, North Coast, you know, they're going to be up about 2% this year versus flat last year. 
And um, when you look at those trends, because of the Craft Beverage Modernization Act, I actually think last year we saw some reductions because of what happened in 18. And this year we're seeing a recovery of that. But honestly, traditional still wines are only growing about 1%, as I mentioned, for the overall industry. Sparkling wines, which had been driven really more by imports than domestics, have seen a decrease this year. Although you'll see an increase in Nielsen, but Nielsen hasn't been able to make up for the uh, da downside in restaurants and other channels. When you look at overall growth, the biggest growth has been flavored wine products. And really these are products that are wine based that are competing with hard seltzers. And I don't know how many people have seen agave based wine products coming out of Mexico in cans. And it's a small piece of the hard seltzer market or the competition for hard seltzer, but it's a considerable piece of what's driving wine today. Another big piece of growth has been vermouth. And as you've seen the shift away from on-premise um, spirits is actually driving the most growth in the overall category today. And I look at the vermouth growth as just part of the cocktail at home boom. And even though vermouth has doubled in sales, I would say most of this has not actually been consumed. It's people buying a bottle of vermouth to make a Manhattan, um, mix in a martini, however they're using vermouth and mixed drinks. The other significant increase at 12% has been bulk imports. And this is really mostly coming into California, but it's filling the niche because of the demand for some of the big um, mass market wine sold through grocery stores um, that are driving that growth. And it benefits California wineries because most of them are bottling that here, but it's not really driving the profitability or the top dollar line. Looking at domestic producers, um, traditional still wines last year were flat. This year we're up about 3.3% with preliminary numbers. Uh, it's a good trend, but again, flattening that out because of the Craft Beverage Modernization Act. It's probably 1.5%. We've taken a little bit of share from imports over the last year, but it's not stellar growth. Um, bulk imports of other piece, and surprisingly, domestic vermouths and flavored wine products have actually declined, although, although the overall industry is up. Uh, I won't get into the import numbers because they'd rather focus on just the domestic and North Bay, but it's a challenging time to look at the numbers for a number of reasons, but it's also some interesting times just where the business is moving. Looking at consumer spending, um, total market up 6.6% in volume, but down 9.6% in consumer spending. Off-premise is up 16% in volume, but down or and up 10% on dollars, whereas on premise, you know, you're down almost 50%. But when you start looking at uh, domestic wines and you look at that off premise in terms of the general market of um, the three tier system, volumes are up about 15%, but uh, in value is up about 21% because people are trading up, they're spending more on what they're buying, but you have to think about uh, top tier. Napa Cabernet producers and take whether it's uh, Cama, Silver Oak, um, Phelps, Cake Bread, they saw their on-premise business dry up, so they transferred more of their allocations to off-premise. That's helping drive that off-premise number. Yet a consumer that was paying $150 or $200 for a bottle of wine on-premise may only be paying $50 now. So it's a funky uh, funkiness in the numbers that you really have to dig into. Direct to consumer from wineries, our estimates are that, uh, and this is working with Wines of Mines Analytics, you know, volume is up about 25%, value up about 14. That shift in value is really goods that used to be sold out of the tasting room are now being more sold through that direct to consumer route because of e-commerce by wineries. But the carryout business we estimate to be down about 40% this year and on-premise uh, mid 40%. And so it's a real difficult thing to look at. But again, just domestic wines, they're doing a little less well volume wise, primarily because of that uh, flavored beverage wines that are imported. Dollar wise, domestic wines are doing a bit better than total wine industry, but still down 8% in consumer spending. But the reality is as wine suppliers, we tend to look at what our bottom line looks like or our revenue looks like as to pose what consumers are spending. Taking those same numbers, um, volume is up for domestic suppliers 3.4%, but our best estimate is that 
uh, revenues for suppliers, they're only going to be down about 0.3% this year. And really that's the, this is looking at the shifting of price points, looking at shifting the channels, looking at um, how the consumer is changing where they're spending, how much they're spending. So net net as domestic suppliers, we may be spending more to cover a lot of things to deal with the pandemic, but top line revenues may not be down much. And this is actually a little better than I had estimated back in uh, the summer. Trying to look at uh, producers in Napa, Sonoma, um, looking at the same type of numbers, overall volume will be up, up about 1.7%, but the, uh, you'll see big increases in three-tier off-premise and direct-to-consumer shift, but significant declines in uh, carryout from the wineries and on-premise. And net-net, the Napa Sonoma producers overall will be down about one, one to 2% on top-line revenue. A couple of things, when I talk Napa Sonoma producers, this is people that are based primarily in Napa Sonoma. And these are people that are selling about 80 million cases of wine this year. When you actually look at the Napa Sonoma grape supply, it only produces about 22 million cases. So there's a number of uh, wine companies based in the North Coast that actually sell a lot of wine from other uh, regions of the state. So you have to look at this and say certain people are going to be winning. Other people are going to not look as good. You know, quite honestly, large companies that do a lot of their business through um, major retailers, they're showing this kind of growth in off-premise three tier or maybe even better. But smaller companies that have relied on on-premise in their tasting rooms, you know, they are going to be looking at 30, 40, 50% declines in revenue. So while well, this is looking at a kind of a generic Napa Sonoma producers, there's a lot of uh, variability depending on size of producer. The 2020 crush and wildfires impact, it was, you know, it's um, laid on even more hurt after with the pandemic. Um, the reality though, is that the industry was in excess of supply prior to the 2020 harvest. And it was especially in coastal areas rather than the valley areas. Our estimate, BW-166 and Gomberg and Fredrickson prior to the fires was that the crop this year would have been down to about 3.6 million tons versus 3.9 million tons of wine grapes last year. Post the fires, we think there was another 200,000 tons or so lost because they weren't able to be picked, uh, other issues and quality, et cetera. So the crop will be about 3.4 million tons um, in 2019. And that's actually the lowest crush since uh, 2011 for the state. One of the benefits of that is it is going to balance out the overage that we had, but it's going to be inconsistent. But the other thing with the wildfires, uh, we did some work for Wine Institute and looked at the cost of the industry of the wildfires and looking at, you know, damaged wineries, lost crop, uh, wines not made, assuming that, you know, the industry was not in surplus, total cost of the industry of the wildfires uh, last fall were, would be $3.7 billion for an industry that generates, you know, just over $22 billion of revenue a year. It's so almost 20% of revenue, 18%. Um, this is primarily lost sales of those grapes that weren't picked. And if you actually look at it, um, that peak of where the, those lost sales will be is in 2023. The reality is the industry will not totally lose that $3.7 billion because we were in excess some wineries will adjust release dates um, and other things. So you won't see a, you know, one year where the revenues of wineries will drop 3.7 billion, but it is a big economic impact uh, for the industry. And I wanna talk a little bit about that in a little bit uh, in a few further slides about what possibilities are that for that in the future. The other thing I'd like to say again, this is generalities across the whole industry. Uh, the impact will be difficult for everyone, but it'll be variable. Some people who are long in inventory will be in better balance, while others that have shortages are going to have to actually do a lot more to adjust for those lost sales. Future expectations. I've heard from a few people that, you know, the hopeful view is once we get to herd immunity, we're going to have the roaring 20s and everything's going to be back to normal. Uh, another thing I've heard, you know, recently was, you know, later this year we'll be celebrating like VE Day in 1945. 
And I think those are hopeful and hope is something to relish, but it's not a strategy. And so I think as an industry, we need to hope for the best, but plan for something less. 2021 will be a challenging year. As Sarah said, the second half is going to be brighter than the first half, but it's still going to be challenging and we don't know what that second half will be. You know, one thing to think about with our industry, there's 247 million legal, legal drinking age adults in the US. You know, based on long-term trends from Wine Market Council, 35 million people drink 85% of the wine. And that 35 million people are actually a lot of those high earners that Sarah uh, pointed out that haven't seen as much of a decline in uh, earnings of lost jobs, et cetera. So, you know, the wine drinker has not been as negatively impacted as a majority of the population. When you look at the North Bay, and you know, a lot of the wines in the North Bay are sold for over $25 a bottle. And it's really less than 10% of the volume of wine sold in the US. It's likely that only about three and a half million people drink 85% of these wines. So something the industry has done for a long time, but we will need to continue to do and our future expectations need to look at this is which niche of the population are we really selling to not looking at the total uh, macro population. As we go forward, and it's almost like thinking of a canary in a coal mine. You know, we need to think about what markets do we watch as to what's going to happen with uh, and how it may translate to wine industry sales. And I've looked at this and said, you know, really New York, San Francisco, and Las Vegas should start to give us some indications of what's going to happen market wide. Uh, the first two, you know, how much of a reduction are we going to see of office work moving to the home? And how much does that translate to? Um, less travel for business. Companies have learned that they don't have to spend as much money on travel, so they will restrict people from traveling as much. If people work more from home, there's going to be less after uh, work drinks. Um, and all of this is going to have impacts on the wine industry. Some of them may be good because people will drink closer to home rather than in big cities, but it's going to be how do you adjust your business for that? Uh, Sarah said we should see a return to travel. And I think Las Vegas is going to be a place where you're going to see that travel start because they're going to need to market as much as anybody. But we need to watch how travel resumes, how much people are willing to spend for leisure spending because they've gotten used to not spending as much being at home. And then the other thing with social distancing, you know, how much will people be willing to want to be back in crowded environments versus wanting some more space? And so crowded on premise establishments may have a tougher time. I can't tell you what the what will actually be, but these are all things as an industry and as individual operators we need to be looking at. Looking at channels, off-premise three tier, you know, one thing I can say with utmost confidence is that we're going to see a decline in the big retailers in, uh, beginning of March of 2021, mainly because you're not going to see that panic mine that took place in March, April last year. We're going to see enhanced opportunities in smaller retailers that were harder hit by the pandemic. But the reality is we may actually see reduced shelf placements in retail is retailers manage available cash. And so that means people are going to have to fight for um, placements even harder than they ever had in the off premise. E commerce is here to stay. We've seen a significant increase in home grocery delivery or curbside pickup. Um, the interesting thing is it actually changes the dynamics of how a consumer shops for wine. And there's not that impulse purchase necessarily when they're in a store. And so we have to look at how that's going to translate. Um, Wine.com has been a great success story this year. You know, uh, they just had a press release that their revenue was up to 329 million for the 12 months ending December. They're the biggest pure play uh, e-commerce wine company, but it's still less than 1% of 2020 retail sales. So it's moving in the right direction. Um, the numbers I've heard is that, you know, the online e-commerce for groceries is about 10% of sales now. So that's an increasing piece, but the traditional way of selling wine still exists. This whole thing about the online shopper, we need to learn how to communicate better in a three-tier system. I think you're going to see retailers wanting uh, more advertising dollars paid to support uh, getting the eyeballs of the, those consumers when they're doing their online shopping. But it's going to be a challenge because of tight house laws, uh, which most other consumer good, goods do not have, but uh, wine and spirits do have. On premise, we may see a 
declined 25% of accounts selling wines in the on-premise. Uh, it just how many accounts have been reported to be out of business. You know, National Restaurant Association says 17% of on-premise operators are out of business today. You know, when I look at the data for quick service restaurants versus full service restaurants, quick service restaurants are back to about the same revenue and staffing as they were pre-pandemic. Most of the declines in on-premise have been full service restaurants. And it is real tough to say how they come back, where they come back. Um, my own view, talking with restaurateurs, even when they get back to reopening, their menu offerings for takeout have been reduced. They found that they can reduce their overheads by having a shorter uh, menu. Um, because of cash constraints, they're gonna have to have shorter wine lists and wine by the glass offerings. Much as I said for on-premise, it's gonna take more work then to get those placements in the on-premise versus what it used to be for the industry. You know, one theory I've heard, and this kind of goes with what Sarah said, there's a lot of credit out there and there's lots of money on the sidelines and it will to potentially invest in new businesses and restaurants could be one of those because of the decline in the restaurant category. But, you know, an alternative theory is that um, banks will be slow to lend to new operators because their um, balance sheets and income statements aren't gonna be, look too good. Again, we can't say what's going to happen, but it will be probably a slower recovery than we would like, and it's not going to get back to what we knew in 2019. Um, I said it's going to be tougher to get those on-premise placements, and so I would say relationships are going to be key with wholesalers and with the restaurateurs to get that business on-premise. Direct-to-consumer. We've seen increased sales ship from wineries uh, in 2020. And it's going to take work to maintain that, but I think it's a it's a increased capacity that wineries have that they need to work to maintain. Um, wineries need to grow from the e-commerce capabilities they developed in 2020 because e-commerce will become more important. Um, wineries are going to need to rebuild their winery visitor programs, and what I talked about in Las Vegas, so looking at how people are wanting to travel. You know, I think wineries are going to have to look at different ways of promoting travel back to Napa and Sonoma. You know, one scenario may be that the Bay Area is not quite ready to travel long distance, but they may want to do trade day trips locally and it may benefit the wine industry. But it's going to be wineries looking at how to do that winery by winery. As noted on future expectations, consumers' habits have changed and we need to keep looking and figure out how they have changed how we play to those changes and for direct consumer, how do we need to keep evolving and improving to rebuild that, especially winery visitor that builds those club sales over time. Millennials, I mentioned that, you know, boomers started growing the wine industry when they were 37. Uh, millennials won't average 37 until uh, 2023. But um, I think we've been expecting too much of the millennials building the business to this point. But looking at the pandemic, it's changed habits. There may be more dining at home. Yeah, dining at home may be good because, you know, how do you get that bottle of wine on the weeknight dinner table? It's, you know, that's the way boomers built the wine business initially. And I don't think millennials have done that as much. I look at hard seltzers and it's kind of a similar to um, light beer or wine coolers in the 80s when people were looking for lower filling, lower calorie type products. And, you know, eventually people evolved away from wine coolers, light beers stuck around. But I think there's an evolution for hard seltzer drinkers. And how does the wine industry move those hard seltzer drinkers to wine? I mentioned that, you know, boomers had stepping stones from fighting varietals to premium varietals to higher price varietals, et cetera. And not necessarily for Napa Sonoma, but the industry needs to look at how are we gonna build those stepping stones for millennials like we had for baby boomers? Um, the reality today is that if you look at a serving of wine, beer, or spirits for somebody drinking at home based on the average price of those products, wine costs about twice as much. I actually think wine provides a value twice as much as beer or spirits, but we need to look at um, going forward, how do we justify those price points to younger consumers? Um, ethnicity, millennials are much more diverse than the boomers. And how do we sell to a more diverse uh, group, unlike the boomers that were primarily uh, non-Hispanic white. 
And then cuisines have changed dramatically. And we need to look at how do we continue to market our wines to a much broader base of cuisines than what we typically had in the 90s and 2000s. Climate and wildfire risk. When I did the work for Wine Institute on the impact of the wildfires, I also did a fair amount of reading on history of uh, fire and drought and everything in California. Everybody knows in 2020, we had the highest uh, recorded acre num number of acres burned in California at 4.2 million acres. Um, there was a study, prehistoric fire and emissions and the references here, but prior to 1800, California typically had somewhere between four and a half and 12 million acres burned in each year. And it was the nature of the um, landscape, nature of the Native Americans and the burning they did to manage forests, et cetera. Another thing, looking at another uh, issue on drought, California has suffered through periods of droughts for centuries. And so drought and uh, forest fires are nothing new to California, but it's been fairly new uh, from what we've experienced over the uh, 1900s and into the early 2000s. Um, as I say this, I'm not saying we don't need to address climate change, but we can assume that climate change and addressing uh, carbon emissions will solve drought and fire issues in California, given long-term history. Um, I had a discussion with uh, David Block and Anita at UC Davis recently, and just talked about, you know, what we learned from the wildfires this year, but what do we really need to learn? And, you know, one of the things they said was we need cheaper, faster diagnostic tools, need to assess risks better, need to identify baseline levels for varietals and wine styles, identify best remediation treatments, et cetera. All of this takes money for research. And to be honest with you, even with all the incentives coming from Washington because of the pandemic and whatnot, tax dollars are not being allocated for research for our industry or in any industry. But just talking with them, they said really to do the research right, the university would need about $10 million over five years. I think as an industry, we need to start relooking at investment for industry-wide projects. And when you think about 10 million over five years versus wildfire impacts of 3.7 billion, it's a fairly cheap investment. And I'm just saying this because uh, when we look at the future, we want to be better prepared when something happens again, like the wildfires in 2020. In conclusion, 2020 has been a challenging year. 2021 will be better as the year goes on, but it's still gonna face challenges. Um, as an industry, we need to find ways to attract a new generation of consumers. Uh, the industry truly has to take care of its own needs. We can't wait for somebody else to do it for us. These are very macro comments, but each wine company has to chart their own course to their own success because everybody is different. But you know, one thing I can say after uh, more years than I care to admit in the industry, uh, wine is still one of the best industries to be involved in. Smart operators just need to work hard and uh, we can find ways to succeed. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, John, for sharing your perspective on the wine industry presently and post pandemic. So we've got a couple of questions here. So if you have a few, few more minutes, I'd like to um, ask them. We've got a couple from the crowd. Is that all right? Sure. Okay, first one we've got is how much of off-premise is actually going to going to distributors who are then DTC. This is a volume that could be picked up by the suppliers directly. Okay, you have a couple of things going on with um, distributors then going to DTC. When you think about wine.com and the growth they've had, mm -hmm. a lot of their business is purchased through distributors. So you could argue that those same sales could be made through um, direct from the winery rather than going through the distributor and wine.com. However, you have to also look at it and say from a portal standpoint, you know, a consumer can go on that portal and find wines, domestic imported thousands of wines versus going and having to hunt for each individual winery. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to say consumers are lazy, but it's actually much more convenient user experience. The other thing is that when you talk DDC, um, you know, I, I've heard numbers of 10% of grocery are now sold online, either for delivery or a consumer pickup, you know, that's another place where maybe those sales could be translated to DTC. I think that's a tougher mm -hmm. one to do. Okay. 
Uh, second question. We learned from you and in our reporting that at the start of the pandemic, the industry saw a huge jump in online wine sales as consumers remain homebound. What key price points, points were strong in those purchases? purchases, luxury wines, or those under $10 a bottle, or maybe both. And what's the future of the online luxury wine business as the market moves to post-pandemic? Okay, really, and it depends on where you slice prices. The average, the direct-to-consumer average price came down during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But if we actually look at it, the, the, ship, the business ship DTC before the pandemic was primarily wine clubs, which are the wineries higher priced wines. And on average mm -hmm. wineries, their shipments are higher priced than their, what they sell out of the retail room. I actually look at it and say some of the wine, lower price wines from the retail room. So it might've been $20 rather than $35 were now being shipped. So it's not really, you know, $10 and under wines, quite honestly, uh, because of the cost of freight, wines under $10 don't make a lot of sense for- uh, To ship home delivery or shipping. They might make much more sense to buy at your grocery store or local retailer, go pick them up curbside if you're gonna order online, but eliminate that shipping cost. So I actually think the online sales are, will continue to be strong. People are moving more to e-commerce. You know, one of the curses of it is everybody wants free shipping. Um, and so it's figuring out how to pay for that. But it's, uh, it, all it all price points over about $20. I think the on, uh, E-commerce direct from wineries through wine.com will continue to be strong. That's good. That's good. I appreciate it. We have, um, I think we've asked. Now, here's another question. What were the characteristics of the growers and vintners who are best positioned in March to survive the pandemic's impact? Um, from a vintner perspective, honestly, it was the people that had good distribution in yeah. uh, big retailers and it wasn't just the mass market wines you know whether it's gallo or it's a boda box from delicato or whatever but even wineries like and i mentioned uh um camus and cake bread and uh, silver oak etc they had distribution of the big retailers but they actually limited the allocation to those big retailers when they the oh. sales dried up with uh, restaurants they all of a sudden gave big uh, bigger allocations of retailers and the retailers were very happy to see them. They were very well positioned. You know, Duckhorn with Decoy was very well positioned. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of, you know, North Coast wine companies. Vintners and the ones that were better positioned were actually the ones doing business with those companies, with the vintners that were well positioned. The growers that were well positioned doing business with those vintners. I think it's been a tougher time for the uh, grower that sells to a number of small wineries that have been hurt much higher, more by the on-premise and uh, declines in tasting room visits. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's no straight lines you can draw on this thing. There's some people that are doing well, others that are not. Luck of the straw, I guess, right? Yeah. All right. Sarah, I have one more question asked by the audience. Do you have a few minutes? I do, yes. Um, what will the what will be the most efficient way to pay down the national debt post COVID? So I think it's, it's going to take a mix of, of tax increases and spending cuts. I think particularly when you look at really what was happening to the deficit before COVID. Um, so, you know, there's, um, a, you know, a lot of people highlight the fact that um, the 2018 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we saw the deficit actually increase um, from that, but the deficit was already increasing even before the Tax Cuts and, and mm -hmm. Jobs Act, and that was actually um, really a matter of just the mandatory spending that we have going on with um, the aging of, of the population, Social Security, health, um, health costs. And so I think really you need to figure out how, how that's going to be sustainable long term. Um, if you think about, you know, the spending composition too, what could actually increase the economy's productive capacity and increase productivity to help us grow, grow out of this. So in, in some ways it matters, um, you know, both the mix of getting that on a sustainable portion, but that's going to be easier if you're spending on things um, that have the potential to actually raise productivity and, and raise capacity to help us grow out of that. Thank you. Wow, what an opportunity given to us all this morning by our panelists. Thank you to our speakers, Sarah and John, for taking the time to be here today. 
We'd also like to thank our underwriter sponsors, Pharrell and Braun and Martel, LLP, Moss Adams, Wells Fargo Bank, Zaboni and Company for making all this possible. And in closing, I'd like to say, our mission of the North Bay Business Journal is to provide the most comprehensive report on our vibrant business community. We'd like to hear from you. How are we doing? And most importantly, what can we do better? Feel free to contact me or our editor and content manager, Anthony Borders, anytime to share your thoughts with us. The North Bay Business Journal is planning a special year of recognitions and conferences. Don't forget to sign up for our next virtual event, the Sonoma State University Economic Conference on February 19. Meanwhile, until we see each other again, thanks for attending and stay safe and healthy.